it is now time for the keynote speech the economics of culture by sanjeev sanyal and may i formally invite him to the podium for his speech honorable minister murli dharan general gupta dr mishra dr doshi intech conveners from all across india ladies and gentlemen it is indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to speak to all of you not the least because i have been for some 20 odd years a life member of intech so i am <laughs> part of your family and so and uh, so is my dad incidentally so he is the one who got me into this and several of you of you may actually know him but today i was asked to speak on the topic of economics of culture <clears throat> and i think the key thing to do not to do here is to do what maybe some of you may be fearing i'm going to do is to try and spend the next 20 minutes trying to estimate what share of gdp culture is because that's largely a pointless exercise as you may imagine because in the end everything is culture you see if i going to try and estimate gdp contributions of culture then i have to spend a lot of time working out uh what is culture maybe we we take uh um, tourism how much of tourism is due to culture or how much of entertainment and media is due to culture is gastronomy part of culture if that is so are all restaurants part of culture and part of gdp um if entertainment and media is part of culture should we consider for example all the entertainment we get from our tv debates part of culture so there is no end to it and largely a pointless exercise in my view the point is that both culture and economics are central to the human experience and human endeavor and they are intrinsically linked as i am going to uh, speak to you so i think this reductionist view of trying to separate culture out in some put it in a box which is separate from other ac human activities is largely a pointless activity and the really interesting part of <clears throat> the economics of culture is how much it is really a part of the overall a uh, national experience and the national effort that we are putting in to understand that let's step back a bit when you think for example of the european renaissance now typically today when we think of the european renaissance well we'll think of maybe you'll think of florence and the wonderful buildings in florence or you'll think of venice and you know the uh canals of venice and and an extraordinary buildings uh you know uh paintings and uh, uh architecture and sculpture that you see in many of these places maybe you will think about the renaissance and the, and the paint, dutch painters in amsterdam and so on but the key thing to remember about that about the european renaissance is that it was not just an artistic flourishing it was very much a part of a wider flourishing that happened which was in the sciences it happened in the political sphere it happened in uh, philo philosophical sphere and it happened in the economic sphere as well do remember that florence was first and foremost not a center of art it was actually a banking center the contribution of the medici is was actually banking they were the greatest bankers of their time and their invention was the double entry bookkeeping system so all the cathedrals and paintings and other things you see there is actually a secondary side effect of double entry bookkeeping and the same thing is true of venice venice was a commercial center their great invention was large scale maritime trade and the stock market so when you go to venice and see all those buildings remember that they are actually a side effect of a stock market boom over centuries this is also true of amsterdam and all the 
Dutch oil paintings you see, well, look at who those oil paintings are made of, who, who commissioned them, who, who are portrayed in them. Well, many of them are rich merchants of the 17th century. And of course, the rise of Britain as a global power happened under Elizabeth I. She was the one who sent out these great voyages of Drake. She's the one who sank the Armada. And it was under her or, uh, that um, the East India Company was set up. But it was also under her that Shakespeare wrote his plays. So the point I'm making to you is that economic and cultural activity are intrinsically linked. And they're not intrinsically linked in the sort of trivial sense that people become rich and they spend on art. No. They happen simultaneously because both of them require innovation, they require risk-taking, they require thinking out of the box. And during the same society that generates the great economic, scientific, and other, uh, other achievements are very often the same people sometimes who do innovations in the cultural space as well. And this is also true, incidentally, of Indian history. Take, for example, our pride that we have in ancient India's economic prowess. Many of us <clears throat> will know and you know, talk about, and I have written books about this, about the great maritime prowess of ancient India and how Indian merchant networks controlled the seas all the way from Alexandria to uh, uh, the um, east coast of China and Japan and Korea and so on. In fact, as you some of you will know, Korean history actually starts with the marriage of a local prince to a princess from Ayodhya. The greatest and largest temples of Hinduism are not in India, but in Cambodia. And much of this was being spread not through conquest, but through trade. But of course, this was also a route, a highway through which our culture also spread. And here, back here in India, we had these great temples. Now, of course, when we think about these temples, we see these huge buildings. And of course, we all remember about how, they, you know, fables about how they were full of gold and so on. And of course, they attracted uh, invaders as well. But why is it that these huge temples had so much gold? Now, the impression many people may have is that they had so much gold because the kings were all handing over their gold to the, to the temples. Now, I'm afraid, even in ancient times, it was very difficult to get Indian politicians to hand over their gold to anyone. The reason these temples had so much gold was because ancient Hindu temples functioned as banks. And much of the venture capital that financed these great voyages that the ancient Indian merchants were making to all these faraway lands was financed by these temple banks. We have copper plate contracts, and many of them have survived, particularly in southern Indian temples, tripartite contracts between the temple, which were providing the finance, the artisan guilds who were producing the goods, and the merchant guilds who were doing the trading. So the reason I'm telling you this is that Cultural and economic endeavors have always been in, have been intertwined. And so the t same temples that were repertoires of um, artistic excellence, whether it's the architecture of the temples, but the wider ecosystem of dance, of music, and literature, and other things, the ecosystem, that uh, a cultural ecosystem of the temple was at the very same time also a economic ecosystem. So why am I telling you all of this? I'm telling you all of this because we are a part of a living civilization. And when I say we are a living civilization, I mean it. And this requires that we stop to think about our culture as something about preserving in a static form, in a museum sort of way, our culture. It is an evolving culture 
where we both celebrate our past but also celebrate our present and our future and we are a part of a river of civilization that we must think about where our preservation and the economics of our culture but also the culture of our economics has to be to preserve and keep alive as a part of a living tradition what we want to keep going as as a part of our culture so what do i actually mean give me let me illustrate this with a concrete example i have my friend here vijay uh, little earlier you would have uh, heard from him about his efforts that he has been making uh, for many years to bring back indian antiquities particularly idols that had been stolen and he had brought them back i've had the privilege of working with him for almost a decade in this project now when we bring back these idols there is a temptation to take these idols and put them back in put them in museums i've heard very often officials say oh my god you know they were stolen from temples if we take them back to those temples they'll be again stolen and so on and so forth this is a complete misunderstanding of ourselves as a living civilization we are not like the greek and roman civilizations that are need to be seen in museums we are not like the egyptians where we go and see gawk at their mummies in the museums we are a living civilization those idols were created to be worshiped they need to be sent back to the temples from where they were stolen because those temples those communities own them and it's not just about the idol itself and its rightful owner it is also about the fact that there is a whole ecosystem of culture around it there is a whole economics that is around it whether it is the rituals the participation of the community in certain uh, 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 festivals and other activities there is a ecosystem of economics of far, uh, whether it is tourism to the uh, person who sells flowers and incense uh, and the whole culture that goes with it that too is a part of our civilization so to put these uh, idols and stick them in a museum in a way a colonizing power may want us to do is completely missing the point our objection to <clears throat> these idols being in met museum is not the trivial objection that oh we don't like them being in america we would like them to be in a similar museum in india that is not our real objection our real objection is a much more fundamental one which is that they are not meant to be in museums this is a living culture that needs to keep it in the context in which it is to be preserved so that is something i wanted to say because that is what a living civilization would think of its own culture this is also by the way the way we think of other things of course i talked to you about ancient things but also living things that we use today this is the context also in which we need to think about our current effort to upgrade the central vista the central vista is the center of our government of the national capital it's a living part of uh india as a republic today and when we are making changes to it we of course want to preserve the best buildings whether it is north block south block uh <clears throat> or you know india gate and so on but do remember at the same time that it is a living part of the indian state we cannot preserve everything if it is not serving the purpose of providing you with the government you deserve so just as we want to preserve the best buildings it is also fair that we pull down the buildings that have no great architectural value and replace them with buildings that actually provide 21st century governance you can't ask anyone to sit in shastri bhavan and make good policies i'm sorry if you expect 21st century policies you have to provide our civil servants with 21st century buildings in which to function out of 
Now, this is not to suggest that they aren't great buildings in that uh, 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 space that need preservation. They are. I worked out of North Block. It's a beautiful looking building. But let me also tell you, they're awful buildings to actually use as, as offices. Um, they were built 100 years ago for a different kind of office complex. There are many things wrong with it. One of it is just the pure infrastructure of it. They have you know, tall ceilings, they don't air condition well, blah, blah, blah. But that's not all there is to it. There is a wrong iconography that is embedded in it. The idea of a colonial government looking down from Rycina Hill at its subjects. That is the iconography of the buildings that there is, here's the government of a colonial power looking down at the subjects. And even after independence, although we removed uh, the colonial government, the general attitude of it remained the same. The socialist government continued to think that the citizens who come there come as petitioners asking for licenses and, and permits from the, the, uh, you know, uh, the civil servants who will then, in a benign, with a benign smile, sign three times in triplicate uh, in order to provide uh, permissions to the citizens to do whatever they want to do. And so that iconography has to be broken. And so this is why it, is, it was important to change the name of the road from Rajpath, i.e. we rule you, to Kartavyapath. That is the change of iconography that has happened. We will preserve the buildings, but now those buildings will be repurposed. They will be repurposed. One of them will become the National Arts Museum. The other will become the National History Museum. Everybody here, I'm sure, complains about the fact that we've got awful national museum for all our artifacts. These are grand buildings. They will provide the backdrop for showcasing 6,000 years of our civilization. And meanwhile, we in the government will get 21st century buildings. I think it's a fair trade. Moreover, it will democratize rice in a hill. This idea of citizens visiting Raisina Hill as petitioners to the holy gazetted officer will finally end. And now you as citizens will visit it to partake of the cultural heritage of your country. And of course, hopefully, in stage two, we will pedestrianize the whole thing. Raisina Hill, all the way down to uh, India Gate will become pedestrianized except for the crossroads. We would have liked to shut the crossroads, but that would mess up the entire traffic system of Delhi. But what we have already done, as you may have noticed, is built the underground connections so that you don't have to go through traffic. If you, if, so once Raisina Hill has been uh, redeployed, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, we will be able to uh, pedestrianize the whole length of it, uh, except the crossroads where uh, pedestrians will be able to just go underneath it and cross through. And you can imagine the center of Delhi will have these great public spaces, which can be used for picnics, walking around, going for a jog, or great um, cultural events, um, and so on and so forth. And I think in that sense, you, the Indian state will have returned to the people. And as a republic, we will be returning to the people a very good, you know, large, uh, upgraded public space right in the middle of the city. Um, which, of course, we have given that uh, it is the 75th um, uh, anniversary of our independence. We have rededic rededicated by putting Netaji's statue right in the middle there to remind us of those who sacrificed their lives to win us independence. So you can see what we are doing. We have stopped thinking of ourselves in this static sort of way. That even if we, everybody agreed that we needed to build a new parliament, we just couldn't get ourselves to go ahead and do it because, oh, Lutian sahab kya sochenge? Hello. 75 years after independence, all the iconic buildings of all our major cities continue to be buildings built after, before independence. Whether it is Kolkata's Victoria Memorial 
or it is Mumbai's Victoria Terminus. I mean, you can rename it, but it's still Victoria Terminus. I mean, how long are we going to genuflect to Queen Victoria? We need to build iconic buildings of our times. That too is a part of a continuing culture. With that, let me stop, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for giving me an opportunity. Thank you, Shri Sanyal. As an eminent economist of the country today, and being a member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister, having been the Principal Economic Advisor to the Finance Minister for five years till February 2022, having represented India on many international forums such as OECD and G7, being the co-chair of the G20's Framework Working Group, and before joining the government over two decades in the financial markets as the global strategist and managing director at the Deutsche Bank. Your views on paying heed to cultural ecosystems while planning economic development is very, very valuable to us. An inclusive culture and economic interconnectedness may just be that critical component in the best practices of heritage conservation that will assure its survival and longevity. And ladies and gentlemen, I am extremely happy to share with you that Sanjeev Sanyal is also a member, a life member of INTAC for last one decade. So thank you, Sanjeev, once again. <laughs>